And the structure of the framework provides insight into opportunities and institutions for collaboration. Coming back to this basic point of where does collaboration fit in this? There are some obvious points. For example, in this, in this interim of discretion where the government and private sectors and, and the private sector are sharing discretion, that's obviously a collaborative process. And it's, it's one that the government needs to consider very carefully. How do we work with the private sector in this uh, discretion sharing mode? But it's much more than that. It can go all the way back to the beginning where we're identifying the environmental problem. We say, do we care about this? How do we value this and engage the private sector with this? Do we care about uh, uh, resource depletion or uh, do we care about uh, uh, wildlife and habitat? We can also engage between the government and the private sector in terms of what's the fundamental problem? What's the root of the problem? Is it really an information problem? Or is it that you don't have enough solutions, enough alternatives to this problem? Or is it that people just don't care? And engaging with the private sector is an opportunity to collaborate over the direction uh, of, of, the, uh, of the policy. And then, of course, the issue of where are we going to apply these policies? The private sector has a very strong opinion, often has a very strong opinion, about where the policy instruments should be applied. And engaging with the private sector over that issue, identifying where are the best points, where are the points where we're most like, likely to succeed if we put the pressure there. That's an important part of the collaborative process. And I could go on, but the, the point is that, that there are lots of opportunities throughout this for identifying opportunities for collaboration. Uh, voluntary instruments, which often combine multiple instruments. Why? Because there's multiple roots of the problem. So voluntary instruments often bring several different types of instruments with low, low uh, financial incentives, but broad application. They'll go for uh, technology innovation, innovation, and some uh, externality reduction, all bundled up in one, in one environmental uh, agreement. They also are a prime area for developing collaborative efforts between the, the public, uh, between the government and, and the private sector. And finally, the taxonomy is the same whether you apply it in industrialized or developing countries. Those policy instruments exist no matter where they're applying. But they're more or less, each one is more or less relatively attractive, depending on the context in which uh, it's applied, which is why you need to always examine your policy instruments paying attention to that constrained cost minimization that is saying, in this context, what's going to be the cheapest instrument to achieve our goal? So with that, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to wrap up. I very much appreciate your attention. And uh, I look forward to uh, particularly hearing your ideas on collaborative policy uh, opportunities. Thank you. Richards. Please introduce yourself and your organization before asking questions. You are encouraged to use the microphones, which we will pass to you to pose your question. Maybe I can start with the first question. <laughs> so Professor Richards, uh, through your extensive research on government policies around the world, and with this that, um, how will you assess um, the policy approach of uh, public-private uh, partnerships, uh, PPP models as we know them, uh, in the provision of environmental services. Uh, in what ways can we do better, maybe in the area of cost effectiveness or uh, really risk management? That's a uh, broad, very broad question. Uh, so what I would do on that is say, let's start with this basic question of where are the problems. And uh, if, the, if the problem is, if, if the government looks at this, at this issue and says, you know, the real problem here is that we don't understand what the issues are. We don't understand whether, whether for example, CO2 emissions are actually damaging the environment or how badly or how severe the impacts will be for our country then there's, there's definitely an opportunity for information exchange, for cons consultation at that stage with, uh, uh, with the private sector. But at, a, at another level, if the issue is, you know, the private sector says, there's no question here. We absolutely must do something, for example, about climate change. 
Then the next question becomes, let's explore together what, why we're not already doing that. Identify the problems and collaboratively identify the mechanisms that, um, uh, that we can use to, to address them. Uh, I, I, can, I can tell you from studying uh, climate legislation in the US quite extensively, that before we even got to the legislation, there was a huge amount of consultation between the government and the private sector. I can't say for, for I, I can't say in any, with any honesty that it was all constructive. I think a lot of it was the was the private sector uh, uh, sort of pleading with the government, please don't do anything about this, uh, and trying to explain their economic interests. Uh, but it, it doesn't always have to be that way. And so, um, uh, the, I, I think that we, just as an example, we could look to the UK for, for great, great co collaboration between the government and the private sector in identifying and then very informally working through to what would be some solutions we can all live with. Uh, and uh, and they, they, they have taken some surprisingly creative uh, uh, approaches to that. Thank you. Okay, uh, Chris from SEI. Uh, question for you, actually I guess in the sense more of a clarification. Uh, if I'm understanding the, the slides correctly in, in the uh, taxonomy as you're approaching it, in a sense would you say that it's kind of a process of constructive elimination to you get to the final so choices that might be most appropriate and then to understand the interrelationships and, and how to maybe order them or package them? That, that, that would be one approach to using that kind of, and I like that term. I'll we'll footnote you when I use that. Uh, constructive, uh, constructive elimination, basically working down the process where you go, yeah, it, here's the root problem, here's the fundamental role we want for government, here's who we want to have paying for it, and here's who we want to give discretion to. But it's, but it's also one of opening the field first, of identifying the full breadth of policy instruments that are available. One of the problems that we've had historically <coughs> is uh, that by focusing on market-based instruments and command and control and setting up this dichotomy, we forget this huge range of, uh, of, of options for addressing the problem. And so the, the first step is actually to open up the field of alternatives and then engage in what, you, what, what you've called constructive elimination. So in a sense, it's so that people don't do it uh, in one direction or another too quickly and try to narrow to something that might not be appropriate or even uh, feasible. Right. And then you apply this constrained cost minimization to the analysis of the various uh, of the various options to help you say, here's the one that is politically feasible, it's legal, and overall it minimizes the sum of all relevant costs. My name is Hong Kong, from It's very interesting. But I think a lot of this at the end of the day leads to basically behavioral change. All right? You know, it's behavior, it's uh, lifestyle and behavior. And unfortunately, unfortunately, I don't work for the government, but I say that the government has actually done a very good job. Yeah, it's very convenient for everybody to get rid of solid liquid waste. So fundamentally, a lot of this work is, is towards changing, you know, an active. Okay. Um, I would say that if we didn't have plastic max, then I would say that our incineration plant probably need a lot more fuel. All right. So how we address the issue that in fact, you know, basically it's human nature that we need to change. Yeah. Uh, we can pass all the rules, regulations, as we can see in, in the region. They are very good at you know passing regulations. But at the end of the day, that's obviously an enforcement part. But yeah. So even though that you know we're talking about uh, behavior. We cannot change it. It has become almost an acceptable, uh, you know, action of positive practice and entitlement. Okay, uh, sure. The uh, uh, first, I absolutely agree with you that it's about beha behavioral change, or it can be about behavioral change. Sometimes it's just about understanding we have an environmental problem, or coming up with alternatives to the current uh, current arrangement. For example, we put a lot of money into renewable energy technology so that we have an alternative to the current arrangement. But once, once we've addressed that issue, we still have to change behavior. 